Catalunya, a master degree uh, at the University of uh, Rome, in structural engineering, and uh, a PhD in uh, structural engineering at, uh, by, at, um, by the Department of Structural, uh, Geotechnical and Structural Engineering uh, at the University of Rome, La Sapienza. Uh, she is, uh, she, uh, she, the, uh, her uh, main uh, uh, research interests uh, are focused on computational strategies uh, for multi-scale analysis of composite materials with a special focus uh, on uh, non-linear behavior, and uh, she will give uh, his, uh, her lecture in, um, right now, and we, of course, uh, thanks a lot uh, the, the Dr. Bellis uh, for accepting our uh, invitation for uh, a, a lesson uh, within uh, the, our doctoral course. Please.
Can you hear me now? So I will go back. That's great. So uh, I was saying that uh, this lesson uh, is divided in uh, two parts. In the first part, um, focus will be on uh, classical techniques. So well-established first order computational homogenization techniques uh, that are based on the use of classical Cauchy uh, continua at uh, both scales of interest. Uh, in a few slides, you will see that uh, we will consider two or more scales of interest for uh, the description of heterogeneous materials. In the second part of the lesson, uh, we will, uh, uh, and so in this first part, since it is well established in the literature, um, is uh, related to well-known uh, published book or articles, papers. So reference paper, paper, seminal papers that uh, uh, I will uh, uh, consider and I will uh, investigate, I will analyze with you. The second part, on the other end, is um, devoted to um, uh, the uh, so-called enhanced homogenization techniques. So um, uh, techniques that are uh, um, uh, conceived for uh, uh, overcoming some uh, problems, some limits uh, exhibited by classical techniques. Um, especially uh, limits related to the choice of particular microstructures um, that uh, uh, show peculiar uh, physical phenomena. Um, and this second part uh, will be um, uh, more related to my uh, own research interest. So I will show you uh, especially um, some results uh, borrowed from my uh, from, from publications in which I am a co-author. So uh, let's start with the <laughs> beginning and uh, let's try to set the scene. So uh, what is the problem that we want to solve? Um, we, our aim is to simulate and predict uh, mechanical response, in general physical response, of heterogeneous materials. So materials that, following the uh, definition given by Nemat Nasser, as you can see in quotes, uh, heterogeneous materials are solids with uh, micro defects, such as cavities, cracks, and inclusions, as well as with elastic composites. Let's uh, have a look to uh, such materials just to, um, um, to understand the, uh, the scenario. So uh, heterogeneous materials can be classified uh, in uh, several um, ways. For example, uh, here in Bargman et al. So uh, you can see the citation on the, on the side of the slide. Um, heterogeneous materials here are classified uh, distinguishing, between, distinguishing between porous and non-porous media. You can see that in non-porous media, uh, fall polycrystals, uh, composite uh, bicontinuous matrix inclusion composite, as well as in uh, porous materials, you can find agglomerates, fabrics, aggregates. This is uh, one possible classification. Further classification, is uh, the distinction uh, between periodic composites. So uh, you can see very different composites here. Uh, you, can, you can see some examples that are um, characterized by uh, a periodic microstructure. So, so a microstructure that can be um, somehow um, repeated. So the, the entire microstructure can be reconstructed by repeating uh, in plane or in, in a 3D uh, framework, a uh, building block that is a periodic uh, building block. And you can see here uh, examples that uh, uh, range from fiber reinforced composites 
up to uh, lattices that uh, here are, uh, for example, uh, um, 3D printed uh, lattices. Uh, also, um, you can find this kind of uh, periodic composites also in uh, nature, for example, for example, nacre, or uh, composite inspired by uh, uh, bio, uh, uh, biology, for example, here you can see biomimetic composites that uh, in this case exhibit um, extreme uh, properties in terms of fracture resistance. Uh, also, dental enamel is a periodic, uh, is a composite with periodic microstructure, or also the uh, brick masonry, uh, brick masonry walls uh, can be uh, considered as periodic composites. Um, on the other end, um, composites uh, can instead um, show a random microstructure. So uh, in these cases, and here uh, uh, in the same way I show you uh, some examples, in this case you cannot uh, uh, find a, a periodic uh, so you cannot find a, a, a unit cell that can be uh, repeated periodically to uh, uh, recreate the entire volume or the entire structure. So, uh, for example, in fiber reinforced composite, metallic foams, polycrystals, or even uh, porous rock or bones, cancellous bones, microstructure is... Uh, it can be uh, completely random or, uh, or uh, can uh, anyway be characterized by uh, random uh, fields. Mm. One um, uh, thing that you can find in all uh, the material, all the examples I show you, uh, that is, uh, um, uh, that is the same for all the materials, is uh, the multi-scale nature of such materials. So uh, typically, um, irrespective of uh, the material, you, you can uh, choose uh, between uh, uh, the example I show you, you can uh, uh, investigate uh, the material at different scales. And uh, you can uh, find uh, that at different scales of interest, material, the material uh, show uh, different features. Um, so uh, in other words, uh, such materials are intrinsically uh, multi-scale materials. And uh, uh, in few slides, you will understand that we will exploit this uh, property of the material to, uh, and this property of the material can uh, guide us in defining uh, the method of investigation. So the, uh, the, the way in which we study this material. Um, another important distinction uh, that we can uh, that we can uh, do uh, in uh, an uh, introductory uh, framework is uh, that these materials can uh, show different material behavior, uh, both ranging in linear and nonlinear uh, ranges. For example, uh, you can have that such materials can exhibit a linear response, a linear elastic response, isotropic or anisotropic, uh, or at least can exhibit such, uh, such material behavior in a certain range of stress and strain uh, search, uh, um, uh, loading, uh, loading type. Or these materials can exhibit instead nonlinear behavior, ranging from linear elasticity, viscoelasticity, plasticity, um, you can have uh, also phenomena as crack, crack uh, nucleation and propagation, dislocations, inelastic creep, relaxation, so, uh, and, and even phase transformation. Here, uh, I, mm, 
I wrote down some uh, references uh, just uh, to um, uh, just to uh, to inspire you in uh, maybe uh, in finding some uh, some other information. Uh, uh, these are very classical uh, references. Uh, concerning nonlinear behavior, applications ranges from uh, asphalt, bone, ceramic, concrete, uh, up to geological biological tissues. So, with this uh, uh, frame in mind, we uh, uh, so we um, want first of all to uh, understand how to deal with this problem. So, which kind of approach uh, do we want to uh, push you to uh, grasp the uh, the mechanical behavior of such? heterogeneous materials. In literature, there are different uh, possible ways, different possible patterns. Um, a first approach is uh, uh, the so-called micromechanical approach. So in this case, you can uh, represent, reproduce, simulate the uh, heterogeneous uh, material in detail, so um, reproducing uh, different materials with uh, uh, each with uh, 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 geometry uh, details and uh, details for uh, constitutive laws characterize, uh, characterizing each phase. Uh, as you can understand, this is a very effective approach because you are able to obtain a very, a very uh, detailed response. And you will uh, understand um, in deep uh, what is uh, the actual um, response of uh, the heterogeneous material. The drawback of uh, such approaches uh, is uh, um, the uh, very high computational costs that are required, especially when you consider structures that uh, have uh, some uh, important uh, extens extension. So, uh, you, uh, so it is very demanding to, uh, to model and simulate uh, big structures with, uh, with this approach. Um, a completely different strategy is uh, the second one. So the so-called macromechanical approaches. The idea is that um, uh, the heterogeneous material is uh, modeled um, just at the macroscopic scale. And uh, so uh, in a sense that you are not able to see in detail how the microstructure is, uh, uh, is defined, but um, at the macroscopic scale, you have uh, closed form uh, constitutive laws that are typically phenomenological constitutive laws that are uh, derived from experiments. Uh, this, uh, uh, this approach has exactly uh, the opposite drawback of the, the, the previous one, because it's very um, uh, easy to, uh, to handle very big structures, but, but the limit is that uh, you are not able to describe in detail uh, what really happen, happens uh, in uh, heterogeneous materials in which uh, the microstructure and the interaction between phases and uh, uh, different, uh, and also the interaction between, uh, in terms of geometries and in terms of um, constitutive uh, behavior uh, is, is a very complicated task. And uh, with this approach, uh, you cannot uh, require a very high um, uh, level of, of uh, detail. So uh, the third possible uh, way, 
So the, the third uh, um, uh, pattern is uh, a good compromise, somehow a compromise between the two uh, uh, approaches we have seen till now. So multi-scale approaches. The uh, main idea is that um, you uh, recognize that uh, these materials are characterized by uh, a microstructure that uh, somehow um, uh, drive the macroscopic behavior. And you um, uh, model the material and uh, with, with all the complexities of this material at two or more levels of interest. So you have uh, a microscopic scale where you uh, represent the material in detail, not the whole material, the whole structure, but the representative portion of the material. So you focus uh, your attention on a, on a restricted portion of the heterogeneous material, and somehow, we will see how in, uh, in two slides, you are able to extract from this representative portion of the material all the uh, important informations that inform the macroscopic scale. So on the other end, you have also a macroscopic, uh, uh, at the macroscopic scale, uh, um, uh, modeling of your structure. And so somehow these two levels of detail are able to exchange information between them. And so, your uh, macroscopic behavior is directly uh, driven, is di directly related to what happens at the microscopic scale uh, without the need of uh, representing in detail the whole structure. In uh, uh, the framework uh, of uh, multi-scale approaches, in the literature, you can find several uh, approaches. Uh, several uh, strategies. And uh, uh, I uh, tried to, uh, to, uh, do, uh, to do a review of uh, uh, approaches that I think that, that are the, the most, uh, that most, mostly influenced the, uh, uh, the literature. And uh, so, uh, what, what I try to do is to uh, present you somehow an overview of uh, multi-scale approaches, uh, starting from uh, the, the oldest one, so the first attempt uh, in this uh, framework, uh, going on up to the, uh, the computational homogenization approach that is uh, maybe now, nowadays, the uh, most used approach in, uh, in this uh, uh, framework. So um, we start from uh, uh, analytical methods uh, that uh, uh, encompasses, encompass rule of mixture. Uh, that is uh, maybe the first uh, example of uh, an homogenization approach that uh, dates back to Voigt and uh, Royce uh, works. Um, there are uh, also uh, analytic, in, in the analytical methods also asymptotic homogenization approach, variational asymptotic methods and mean field approaches. I will not uh, uh, go in, uh, in detail concerning these analytical, these, these three last analytical methods. And here I put just some uh, uh, references uh, to review papers and books. There are um, hundreds of uh, uh, citations uh, you can find in, uh, in these uh, uh, multi-scale approaches. So maybe uh, having a look to review papers and review uh, books can be uh, a good way to start to, uh, to understand uh, this uh, very wide um, ocean. <laughs> uh, then we will go uh, to uh, computational homogenization approaches. And uh, uh, also here, I, for, for this case, I put some uh, review papers and book, 
notes. Um, I uh, underline the uh, Zawi uh, paper that is uh, really a referential paper for uh, a classification of uh, computational homogenization approach. So uh, let's try to, uh, to do a further step in this homogenization uh, topic. Um, I discovered that this term was, uh, uh, was uh, coined by Babuska in 1976. So um, in, uh, in few words, uh, the challenge in uh, multiscale mechanics is uh, the uh, reliable definition of relations that are able to bridge uh, various length scales that uh, characterize heterogeneous materials. And uh, the um, main idea of these uh, multiscale methods is uh, uh, the prediction of uh, macroscopic properties directly descending from uh, uh, a detailed analysis of the microstructural uh, response. And uh, so homogenization is uh, uh, a well-established uh, method that falls within the multi-scale uh, methods. Um, here in red, you can see uh, some uh, uh, references to uh, main steps that historically uh, were done in uh, the framework of homogenization. So uh, first, uh, I will, uh, uh, I will uh, uh, spend a few words on uh, the rule of mixture. That is, uh, as I said before, maybe one of the first uh, attempts uh, in this uh, uh, direction. Um, and uh, here, the models of Voigt and uh, uh, Royce are uh, surely uh, the, the most important. Um, then uh, I also mentioned here uh, the work of Ashelby, but I will not uh, um, have time to go in this, uh, of this, uh, in this uh, topic. I just want to uh, maybe... Uh, if you are curious, you can uh, you can go in depth in depth on this uh, topic. Then, uh, after uh, rule of mixtures, I will um, consider uh, and I, I will uh, present you uh, the work by Hill uh, that uh, is uh, maybe one of the most important in um, continuum mechanics. Uh, framework. Uh, the idea is to use uh, continuum mechanics at both uh, macroscopic and microscopic uh, scales. And uh, uh, Hill uh, um, uh, defined a very important uh, uh, concepts that uh, are the basis that, that, that uh, have been the basis in uh, uh, sub subsequent uh, works. So, um, just a few words on the rule of mixture. Uh, this part is taken from Wikipedia. You can see, uh, you, you can understand how this uh, method is well established in literature. So, um, the, this, this technique was uh, uh, first uh, um, uh, considered for fiber reinforced uh, composites. And uh, um, the idea is that uh, uh, the uh, properties of a composite material can be predicted in uh, somehow a way that mean of uh, the corresponding properties of each material phase. Uh, so the idea is that, uh, so, and, so, and there are two different approaches. Uh, one um, related to axial loading, that is the void model, and a second approach that is related to transverse loading, that is the Royce model. 
uh, these two uh, models uh, uh, give way to rule of mixture. So let's start with uh, the void model. Um, the void model is uh, very simply represented within this uh, picture. You uh, consider a two-phase material in which the phases are uh, in parallel and uh, undergo an isostrain condition. Um, we uh, define uh, phase A with volume fraction VA and, and modulus, uh, young modulus EA, and phase B with volume fraction VB and modulus EB. So, uh, under the uh, assumption of uh, isostrain, void, um, uh, define, so uh, arrive to this uh, last definition. So uh, you can uh, define the stresses in each phase and also the uh, average of the stresses in terms of uh, the volume fraction of the young modulus and of the isostrain uh, epsilon, C, uh, epsilon C for the two phases. Um, from this very simple, uh, maybe trivial consideration, uh, you can define the uh, modulus of the composite material as simply the weighted mean, so the arithmetic mean of the moduli of each phase weighted by the volume fraction. So this is the first approach proposed by Voigt. On the other end, Royce instead um, proposes, proposed a different model with a two-phase material uh, uh, in which the materials are um, uh, in, para, in, in series, are geometrically uh, uh, put in series. In this case, you can assume, you can assume uh, an isostress condition uh, between uh, the two uh, material phases. So sigma uh, is uh, the same. Um, in this case, you can uh, evaluate the deformation epsilon of each material and uh, the uh, average uh, strains has the weighted mean of, uh, of the two uh, deformations. Um, with very simple um, uh, mathematical uh, uh, analytical uh, uh, manipulation, you can define the uh, compliances. So uh, one divided by the modulus of the composite has this expression. So volume fraction of uh, first material divided by the uh, young modulus of first material plus the same for the second material. Um, these two uh, very, very simple models um, give rise to uh, very well-known so-called upper and lower bounds of uh, um, material properties. In this picture, you, uh, you see uh, the results of these two models in terms of elastic modulus has the volume fraction of uh, two materials changes. And you can see that the red curve is uh, the result of the void uh, assumption. And the, the green curve instead is the result obtained with the uh, Royce. And um, as uh, you will see, Hill uh, considered uh, this work and uh, uh, he was able to uh, understand that these, uh, uh, these values are two uh, upper and lower bounds for uh, elastic modules. So uh, you will see that uh, all uh, the homogenization techniques that were developed uh, 
surely um, more complicated than, than these two very simple uh, techniques, um, will give results that fall uh, in between the two curves. So uh, surely uh, results of homogenization techniques or computational homogenization techniques will fall between these two extreme limits. So uh, as I said, this was uh, a very, some, um, someone defined rough uh, attempt to, uh, to, um, to model the response of a composite, uh, two-phase composite material. Um, after this, uh, um, very uh, important was the, uh, the work by Hill. Uh, Hill, um, uh, one of the most uh, uh, important results of this paper here, yeah, the, the first page of uh, that uh, uh, seminal paper of 1963, one of the, the most important results was the Hill's lemma. Uh, that uh, was firstly presented this, in this paper. Uh, this lemma is uh, the basis, the, the, the theoretical foundation for uh, a, a huge amount of, uh, of work done in homogenization from that point uh, on. Um, so uh, he um, also defined the concept of uh, representative volume element. Uh, and uh, put the, he established the basis of uh, computational homogenization. Um, let's see uh, in detail what uh, Hill considered in his paper. Um, he um, focused on a composite made of uh, two isotropic phases. The assumption is that these two phases are uh, firmly bonded together, so no slips between phases are uh, considered. Um, such material can be uh, defined as, uh, uh, as can be regarded as a material with a matrix and embedded inclusions. And um, he uh, didn't uh, made any assumption concerning periodicity uh, or not uh, the, the, the shape of inclusion, the, um, the, uh, their, uh, um, their pattern, so the topology. So it's a completely, uh, and also he, his framework is a 3D, uh, three dimensional analysis. So a completely uh, free uh, material made uh, by matrix and inclusions. Um, another assumption is that uh, the phases are linear. Each phase is uh, uh, linear isotropic. And uh, the elastic moduli of uh, such phases are uh, different so that uh, the uh, overall, so, so the, the, the stress and the strain fields that appear within the heterogeneous material are inhomogeneous. Uh, but this is uh, quite, uh, uh, um, quite uh, trivial because uh, we are considering heterogeneous material. So, um, his aim is to, uh, to understand, uh, to uh, grasp the overall or macroscopic elastic properties of such a composite materials. In particular, uh, he um, wanted to, uh, to understand the dependence, so how the macroscopic moduli depend on relative concentration depend on uh, geometric, uh, uh, ge the geometry of the inclusions and the arrangement uh, of uh, such inclusions. So depend, depend on the microstructure. So um, 
here, in th this picture is just uh, um, an example. Uh, in this picture, uh, I, uh, I put a two-phase material. Uh, in this case, is uh, periodic uh, with uh, uh, inclusions with general shapes. But uh, as, as I said before, uh, the material that he considered is uh, uh, very uh, general. Uh, so uh, what we want to do is to um, uh, exploit uh, homogenization techniques to uh, obtain, starting from this heterogeneous material, an equivalent homogeneous material that, is, uh, that, that represents um, uh, reliably uh, the uh, behavior of the heterogeneous material. So, each material uh, is, as I said before, isotropic, linear, elastic, so uh, characterized by a uh, bulk modulus and a shear modulus. And uh, two materials are denoted by uh, number one or two for distinguishing the, the two uh, phases. Uh, and also, uh, he defined fractional concentration, uh, C1 and C2 for two phases, not important if phase one is uh, the matrix uh, or uh, is the, the inclusion. Um, then uh, uh, let's assume that sigma and epsilon, uh, and epsilon are the stress and the strain vector um, in uh, exploiting and engineering notation. Um, one first uh, assumption is uh, the uh, definition is the average rule. Um, so he defined as uh, uh, so this average rule um, for a, a generic function uh, that lives on the volume V, uh, this, uh, this um, expression, so the average of the function f is one divided by the volume of the uh, uh, integral of f over the volume. So with this in mind, in mind we can define uh, the average stress and the average strain starting from averages that are independently uh, performed over each phase. So, so for uh, uh, at each point of uh, each, uh, here is repeated twice, of each phase, you have, uh, you know the uh, constitutive relations. So for, for phase one and for, and for phase two, uh, you know uh, the uh, C1 and uh, this is this is the uh, uh, inverse of the uh, of the uh, constitutive law and M one uh, matrices. Since you exactly know uh, the uh, properties of two materials, and you are able to average uh, exploiting the uh, the definition I showed you before and uh, able to average these uh, quantities. So um, in case of uh, uniform and isotropic phases, uh, the uh, mean, uh, the averages of stress and the strains are uh, here reported in terms of average uh, strain of each phase of uh, the concentration of each phase and the constitutive uh, properties of each phase. Um, at this point, Hill uh, introduces a very important uh, uh, concept, the concept of representative volume element. Um, he was maybe the first one to uh, uh, define this concept. Uh, a representative volume element is a sample uh, that is structurally entirely typical of the whole mixture on average. So it has to really represent uh, the microstructure. And uh, this definition is very important, contains a sufficient number of inclusions so that the apparent overall moduli is independent on the surface values of traction and displacement. So that can be 
defined as macroscopically uniform. Uh, this means that uh, the uh, properties at the microscopic level, so uh, at the level of heterogeneities, can fluctuate about a mean uh, with a wave wavelength that is very small compared with the dimension of the sample. So that the effects of such fluctuations uh, are irrelevant, insignificant within a few wavelengths of the surface. Um, and uh, uh, so that also the contribution of surface layer to any average can be negligible because uh, uh, you will always find a, uh, a surface layer effect when you consider a portion of uh, heterogeneous microstructure and uh, impose uh, boundary conditions uh, to uh, such sample. So with um, uh, this definition, you can uh, understand that uh, periodic and uh, random microstructure uh, are very different uh, in terms of definition of the RDE. When you have a periodic microstructure, uh, you can uh, very easily uh, recognize, uh, detect a, a portion of the material that repeats and uh, uh, you can uh, th then I will, I will show you uh, consider a unit cell, for example, in this case, uh, a unit cell with one uh, fiber, or in this case, with uh, five portion of fibers, and apply some uh, boundary conditions that um, simulate the presence of the, the medium uh, uh, all around the, the unit cell. So when, when you deal with a periodic microstructure, uh, you can exploit the periodicity of the medium. Different, uh, uh, different uh, uh, scenario uh, is uh, uh, in the case of a random microstructure um, in which you here see uh, very uh, so different uh, squares, red squares, that uh, uh, involve, uh, starting from uh, the center, involve larger and larger, larger portions of the microstructure. So you can see that uh, the definition and the uh, detection of the RVE when you have a random microstructure is an unknown of the problem. Uh, I will uh, um, consider uh, this uh, topic uh, Mm, uh, maybe in the next lesson, and uh, I um, I investigate this topic, especially with Professor Trovalucci, in uh, in uh, different uh, uh, publications. Um, so. Um, Let's assume, so go back to the uh, ill uh, work. Let's assume that uh, for a periodic or a random microstructure, we were able to detect the representative volume element fulfilling the definitions that Hill uh, declared in, uh, in his paper. Um, so uh, in this case, for in RVE, you can um, relate the deformation, the average deformation, average strains in each phase to the average deformation of the uh, all composite, uh, of the all uh, heterogeneous medium uh, through uh, some uh, localization matrices, this A1, uh, one for first phase and another for the second phase, each one depending, directly depending on the concentration of the phase, the Young modulus and the shear modulus. Then um, by exploiting this definition, you can uh, obtain a closed form constitutive 
law um, for the uh, homogenized medium uh, relating average stresses and average strains by means, sorry, by means of the overall constitutive matrix for the mixture. Uh, the same, so in, in uh, an alternative way, uh, the same procedure can be exploited starting from the uh, stresses in, uh, in each phase. And uh, the, uh, the closed form uh, uh, constitutive law at the macroscopic level relating average strain and stresses is the one you see here in terms of this M. Um, so uh, he'll uh, says that if one is able to determine, to determine this A1, A1 and A2, or B1 and B2, and B2 uh, also uh, uh, it is, possi it is uh, possible to obtain these uh, um, uh, closed form uh, relations. And this was the uh, first important result uh, in the work of uh, Ili. Then he reviewed the uh, work of Voigt and Royce. And uh, so here you can see. Uh, which are the expressions of the um, uh, bulk modulus and shear modulus uh, descending from the Voigt assumption and the Royce assumption uh, in uh, the case of um, the two isotropic uh, phases. So um, these two uh, estimates can be uh, found as a, a particular case of his analysis, uh, assuming isostrain, and in this case, the matrix A1 are identity matrices, or the second one in the case of isostress. Um, he, conclude, he concludes that um, neither assumption is really correct because uh, void stresses are the stresses are such that the traction at the face boundaries are not in equilibrium. So the uh, isostrain assumption violates equilibrium in the uh, heterogeneous medium, while the Royce assumption, so the isostress assumption, uh, is such that the inclusions and the matrix would not remain bonded. So this second approach violates um, the uh, congruence. Um, then, okay, I maybe uh, I will go a little bit faster. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> um, then a uh, very important and maybe uh, the most important contribution by Hill uh, in the same paper was uh, 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 an innovative approach that is a uh, uh, strain energy approach that, that uh, uh, established the basis of uh, computational homogenization. So let's define the energy density per unit volume uh, in, uh, uh, in a, a heterogeneous medium. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, uh, strains, so the strain energy density of the, the compliance uh, uh, form. Um, so let's start from uh, this uh, first expression. Uh, Hills says that if we consider any volume of the mixture of unit magnitude um, and consider that this volume undergoes a prescribed surface displacement such that it produces on uh, uh, in, in the, in the um, 
in a homogeneous material a uniform strain. Uh, the average of the strain in the volume can be directly uh, related to um, the um, uh, displacements at the boundary of the volume by exploiting, and here is done, the divergence theorem. So when you define average uh, strain, um, average strain can be expressed in terms of displacements at the boundaries of the, uh, the representative volume of the unit volume in this case. Um, so the total strain energy, that is the integral over the volume of the strain energy density, can be defined by definition as one half of the integral over the volume of uh, stresses multiplied by strains. Uh, if we add and subtract the epsilon with uh, uh, overline, so uh, uh, average uh, strains, you can end up with, with these two terms. So, uh, first term that is uh, the uh, volume integral of the strains that vary in each point of the heterogeneous medium multiplied by the average strain and further term in which sigma multiplies the difference between the deformation at, the, at each point and the average deformation. Um, the second term here repeated is due to an equilibrated field of stress and due to a strain field that is the difference between the actual strain field in the heterogeneous material and the average value of the heterogeneous of the heterogeneous medium. So this strain field derives from a displacement field that is continuous and that vanishes at the boundaries that I can uh, define as uh, U with uh, this uh, symbol. With this in mind, the second term, so sigma multiplied by uh, the gradient of U tilde, um, can be uh, split in two terms by exploiting the divergence theorem. A first term is a boundary integral uh, that is expressed in terms of uh, U tilde, but we know that U tilde vanishes on the boundaries, while the second term is in terms of the divergence of sigma, but sigma is an equilibrated field, so divergence of sigma is equal to zero. So this second term here vanishes. And so an important finding of uh, Hill was that the total energy uh, in this case can be directly defined uh, just by the first of these two uh, terms. And these uh, uh, and, and if you see here, uh, you can uh, put epsilon, overline epsilon out of the integral. And so you end up with this definition. So uh, he found that the average strain energy in any region can be evaluated in this case from average stress and strains when the surface constraints are of a spe specified kind. So assuming the hypothesis written here, so uh, a surface dis a prescribed surface displacement such that um, a uniform strain is produced in a uh, homogeneous material, 
um, assuming this, we end up with this conclusion. And these are the basis of the well-known Dirichlet boundary conditions that uh, we will discuss uh, further on and that are very well known uh, when you uh, deal with uh, uh, homogenization. Uh, the same thing, uh, in a reverse way, the same, so a similar thing can be done starting from the other expression of the energy density, so the second one. In this case, so he says, let's consider a volume of mixture of unit magnitude, and this time let's prescribe surface tractions such that uh, they would produce uniform internal stresses, so this sigma over bar, in a homogeneous material. Similarly, uh, the average of stresses, so this sigma bar, can be, uh, can be uh, treated as a boundary integral because uh, exploiting the divergence theorem um, this uh, uh, average uh, 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 volume average um, can be uh, uh, transformed in, uh, uh, in this integral over the boundary where you have surface traction f and uh, x are the uh, coordinates of the points uh, or on the boundary. Um, with this in mind, he, uh, he uh, uh, does the same steps as before, but, but starting from this different definition of the total energy. Um, in this case, sigma, that is the stress uh, that varies in each point of the uh, heterogeneous uh, material, um, can be treated by adding and subtracting uh, an average value. And uh, analogously of what happens before, we end up with, with these two terms. Uh, in, this, in, this in, in this case, epsilon is the strain field that derives from a continuous displacement field. And this is a stress field associated with vanishing surface traction because are the is the difference between the actual stress in each point and the average stress. So um, this second term can be treated analogously as before. So epsilon can be defined as the divergence, the divergence of uh, uh, the, the gradient of U. And then by exploiting the divergence theorem, you end up with, you split this uh, volume integral in a boundary integral and a further volume integral. And also in this case, this is a um, uh, strain that vanishes on the boundaries and this is an uh, equilibrated uh, stress. So also in this case, the second term here vanishes. And so the uh, strain energy, the total energy, is, um, is defined just as uh, the average of, so the, 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 the product of the stress, of the average of stress and the average of strains. Um, the uh, hypothesis uh, defined here, so uh, the prescription of surface traction such that uh, they produce, they would produce a uniform internal stress in a homogeneous material are uh, the basis of the well-known Neumann boundary conditions. Um, an important finding of this uh, uh, paper is that when uh, you are not considering a, a volume of uh, unit magnitude because the uh, assumption, the initial assumption uh, was that we were considering a unit volume. But uh, when you uh, consider the RVE, so if uh, the uh, portion of the heterogeneous structure or the heterogeneous structure you are considering is uh, the RVE, in this case, 
you have that the two values of the means obtained independently exploiting the first approach and the second approach are exactly the same scalar value. So when you um, uh, detect the representative volume element, both approaches give the same uh, result. Um, this, uh, um, these concepts um, are very important as a foundation of uh, uh, as I said before, of uh, uh, computational homogenization methods and uh, um, are, have been considered, considered exploited and uh, uh, also um, in some cases extended to uh, more uh, general cases from uh, a wide range of, uh, uh, of um, uh, researchers, investigators. And uh, in this uh, uh, framework, I suggest you to uh, uh, have a look at this very important uh, book. I just put here the, uh, the first page, a uh, book by Nemat Nasser and Ori, that is Micromechanics. And here uh, you can see how uh, the concept firstly introduced by uh, Hill uh, were um, uh, investigated and uh, some, in some cases, ex some cases extended, in particular extended to uh, nonlinear uh, constitutive behavior. Um, uh, very important. Uh, uh, work uh, that uh, now I want to uh, at least introduce you. Maybe we will uh, um, continue tomorrow in a few minutes. Um, is uh, a, a paper by Liu uh, in, from 2013. Um, that, uh, uh, so this paper is uh, completely based on uh, the paper by Hill. Um, and uh, uh, in this case, um, the uh, uh, homogenization approach proposed by Hill is, uh, um, is uh, considered uh, and uh, um, exploited in, also in the framework of uh, uh, numerical uh, analysis and is extended then to um, micropolar continua. Uh, and, and, uh, um, but in this, in this work con concerning the part of micropolar continua, uh, there were some open issues uh, that, um, uh, in particular with Professor Trovalusci, we, were, we, we investigated uh, in, def in depth, and I will uh, speak about this tomorrow. But um, um, in the, maybe in the, I can stop here, maybe I'm continue tomorrow. Okay. So uh, this will be the first slide that we will uh, consider. We will see tomorrow together again. And for today, I think it's enough. Uh, dear Maria Lara, thank you very much for your uh, presentation and the retrospective concerning uh, the homogenization theory, and uh, we will wait uh, for uh, the continuation of your lecture to, uh, to, to have the possibility to, to ask you for some questions. As I know that uh, you are uh, in a hurry and uh, we have to stop now. Just a curiosity that I want to uh, highlight is that uh, the concept of uh, representative volume element that mm -hmm. uh, you remember that uh, in current uh, era was uh, introduced by Hill uh, is exactly the concept that Foyt 
introduced in his uh, homogenization approach as the origin as the, that I presented as the origin of uh, multiscale homogenization approach, and is called uh, molecular sphere of action. It's not uh, rigorously mathematically precise, but the concept uh, is, uh, is can, can be reconducted to this uh, uh, rigorous uh, mathematical definition uh, by him. I think that this, uh, um, in the lecture of uh, Dr. Tepellis uh, is uh, fundamental for understanding the basics of uh, homogenization process, processes. And uh, I uh, do invite you to follow the second lecture of uh, tomorrow morning. And thank you again, Maria Laura, for uh, accepting our invitation. And now I think that we stop uh, for uh, 15 minutes uh, attending uh, the seminar of uh, Dr. Meratuna. Okay. So bye bye. See you tomorrow. Dr. Meratuna. And mi sente però? Eh? Eh, ma è partita una presentazione. Cioè, è ritornata. Meral? Yes, professor. Uh, I, I wish to quickly introduce uh, Dr. Meral Tuna, who has uh, a bachelor degree and a master degree in solid mechanics, and uh, get uh, her PhD uh, degree at, uh, uh, in mechanical engineering in 2020 uh, from Istanbul Technical University in Turkey. And uh, she spent uh, one year uh, um, Cor please correct me if, if I am wrong, as uh, a visiting, pro a visiting researcher at, uh, by our Department of Structural and Geotechnical Engineering. And uh, his, her expertise uh, is uh, mainly focus, uh, uh, focused uh, on uh, continuum mechanics uh, modeling uh, uh, with particular attention to non-local uh, continuum, non-classical continuum theories. And uh, her talk will deal with the aspect that I introduced in the, uh, my earlier lesson of explicit and implicit non-local continuum descriptions with uh, different applications. And thank you, Meral, for accepting to give uh, this talk. And uh, uh, we, we are listening for you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Um, my name is Meral Tuna, and I am an assistant professor at Yashar University, Izmir. Uh, I have been working with Professor Travolushi for uh, four years, since 2017, I believe. Uh, and I spent uh, more than one year at a visiting researcher at uh, Professor's Department Structural uh, Engineering. Uh, and um, with Professor, we are mainly working on uh, modeling of complex materials using non-local or, in other words, non-classical continuum theories. And this is uh, what I will be talking today. So I will start with a brief introduction to non-locality. Then uh, I will talk about the methods that can be used to handle such non-local structures. Then I will continue with introducing uh, the classification of non-local uh, theories as implicit and explicit, with particularly focusing on explicit type Erringen's model and implicit type micropolar model. After that, I will try to show the capabilities of these theories 
Uh, and lastly, um, capabilities of these theories through some uh, example problems that we examined over the years. And then lastly, uh, I will point out some remarks. So when the smallest unit uh, of a structure has comparable length with the overall dimensions, the so-called scale effects come into the play. Uh, here by scale effect, I am referring to uh, the effect of discreteness of underlying material organization on the overall behavior, or let's say gross behavior, gross mechanical behavior. So this, uh, the size of the smallest uh, unit uh, could be, the length of the smallest unit could be the size of a brick in masonry wall, or it could be the atomic, uh, the distance between atoms in a carbon nanotube. So in both cases, and the cases like this with a comparable internal and external lens, classical theory of elasticity cannot cover correctly the response of these structures. So we need to use, uh, or let's say utilize different approaches. The most accurate yet computationally in, uh, expensive one is direct discrete, direct, uh, discrete modeling techniques, which includes molecular dynamics, simulations, limit analysis, dislocation analysis, and so on. Um, another uh, approach could be coupled discrete continuum methods, uh, which are also known as partition domain concurrent uh, models, multi-scale models. Of course, this one is computationally more efficient, but it is not very easy to adopt and has its uh, own numerical problems. So last but not the least is enhanced non-classical continuum theories. Uh, these theories account for scale effects. Uh, so this can be used to describe the behavior of such structures when a course modeling is preferred. So this is going to be the topic of today's presentation. Uh, as Professor mentioned yesterday, by following the definition of Kunin, the non-locality refers to presence of internal landscape parameters and spatial dispersion properties in wave propagation. So through these internal land uh, scale parameters, we retain the memory of underlying material organization. Of course, this adds to the uh, material parameters to be determined. Uh, anyway, these theories are suggested to be categorized as explicit strong and implicit weak, depending on the mechanism of non-locality. So I will try to uh, explain the main features and the main differences between these two class of non-local models uh, in a very simple manner. So explicit type non-local models have same number of degrees of freedom as classical case, while implicit type non-local models have extra degrees of re uh, freedom of various kinds. Uh, that is why they are oftenly named as multi-field continua or generalized continua. Uh, explicit type non-local models have same number of equations, but these equations contain integral, integral differential, or finite difference operators, depending how uh, prominent is how prominent the non-locality is. On the other hand, uh, in implicit uh, type non-local models, due to the extra degrees of freedom, the number of uh, equations increased. And in explicit type models, the land scale parameters is directly linked to the bulk properties, which is, uh, which is placed in the constitutive equation. That is why these types of models um, possess a strong non-local character. On the other hand, implicit type non-local models uh, the landscape parameters in implicit type non-local models is linked to the newly introduced additional descriptors. That is why these non-local models have more limited or let's say weak non-local uh, character. Now I will try to briefly explain uh, the Eringen's non-local theory of elasticity. Uh, this is an explicit type non-local model. In Eringen's theory, 
the state of stress at a point is linked to the state of strain of all points in the domain, which means that this theory accounts for long range interactions. And that is why it is particularly suitable to describe the behavior of structures with, uh, that are characterized through these long range interactions. For instance, atomic chains, atomic arrays, carbon nanotubes, graphene sheets, and so on. So these are the degrees of freedom, main relations, and main equations. Uh, here, we use, an we use the integral form of the constitutive equation. Uh, to be uh, more specific, we use two-phase local non-local model. So as the name suggests, uh, this model consists of local part and a non-local part, and the weight in between is arranged through friction coefficients, as you can see here. And this friction coefficient uh, takes values between 0 and 1. So here, kernel function is responsible for covering, uh, to cover the long-range effects. Uh, it is an attenuation type function. In fact, any attenuation type function can be used as kernel function as long as the mathematic, some, uh, mathematical requirements mentioned by Eringian is satisfied. In our studies, we used uh, B exponential type kernel function, which uh, is illustrated for two dimensional case. So as we can see here, the influence zone uh, I'm sorry, the long range interactions practically vanish beyond a certain limit. And this limit is called influence zone. And the radius of influence zone is directly related to non local parameter. And non local parameter contains information about uh, internal structure or underlying material organization. So when friction coefficient appeared here, equals to one, or when non-local parameter approaches to zero, this theory is simplified to local theory of elasticity. Now let's talk about a uh, macropolar theory. So in this theory, uh, the particle uh, in the continuum is, or let's say the continuum is assumed to be uh, constituted with particles, rigid particles, uh, that have additional micro-rotational degrees of freedom. That is why this theory is particularly suitable to describe the behavior of heterogeneous materials with internal structure. Here we see the degrees of freedom. This is additional degree of freedom, uh, some important relations and equations. So due to the presence of relative rotation between Micro and macro rotation, we have non symmetric stress and strain measures. That is why it is also particularly suitable to describe the uh, behavior of orthotropic or anisotropic media. And due to this additional uh, micro rotation, we have additional strain and stress measures curvature tensor and couple stress tensor. And of course, we have an additional equilibrium equation. So when um, micro rotations are constrained to follow the macro rotation, this theory is simplified to couple stress theory. And with further, uh, further assuming that the material, uh, micro micropolar material constants equal to zero, Again, we obtain classical theory of elasticity. As we know, obtaining an exact solution is not always the case. That is why uh, sometimes we need to utilize numerical techniques. And in our uh, studies, we generally adopt a finite element method. That is why I am going to present this formulation in a very simple manner, considering two dimensional case and uh, linear elements. Of course, we can simplify to this formulation to one dimensional case, or we can extend the formulation to three dimensional case. Uh, I think the most important point here is the effect, the understanding the effect of long range interactions. As we can see here, 
due to the strong non-local character of Eringen's model, uh, the stress and inherently strain energy of an element, let's say element M, depends on the displacement field of all elements that reside its that that it um, that located in the influence zone of the corresponding element, which is why these derivations are not vanish and cause additional terms in element formulation. And by additional terms, I am referring uh, referring to third and fourth terms. So these terms cover the contribution of elements to each other. And here we have non-local parameter, which is directly linked to the bulk properties and which defines the stiffness matrix of the structure. On the other hand, in micropolar model, we have uh, the land scale parameters are incorporated only through newly, newly introduced additional descriptors. That is why this theory has a limited non-local character. Uh, so now I want to talk about uh, some applications of these theories. Uh, first, I want to start with uh, atomic chain problem. Uh, we consider a one-dimensional atomic chain uh, that consists of um, identical atoms, equally spaced identical atoms. And to uh, present uh, interatomic relations, we use linear elastic translational springs, considering both nearest and second nearest neighbor relations. So for, for this case, the formulation of an atom takes the following form. And as equivalent continuum model, we consider a bar discretized uh, with Acquisized bar elements, and the formulation for an any element takes the following form. So, as we can see here, these terms, including second neighbor relations, and the term including contribution of elements to each other, is responsible or is related to long range effects. Of course, in order to correctly determine the behavior of this atomic chain using Eringen's model, we need to correctly determine the material properties. And in doing so, we consider energy equivalency under uniform deformation field. So we say that internal energy of the unit cell equals to uh, strain energy of the corresponding domain in the continuum model. So from this uh, equivalency, we obtain a relation between spring constants and material properties. And here we illustrate the variation of Young modulus with respect to uh, fraction coefficient for different non-local parameters. So here we have a problem. At least we have two unknown parameters which is Young modulus and non-local parameter, let's say for full non-local model, but we only have one equation. Moreover, the variation of Young modulus uh, with respect to fraction coefficient and non-local parameter is not very pronounced. So to individually detect the values of these parameters, we adopt an optimization approach. In our case, we use differential evolution method, but any optimization method can be used for this purpose. So in this case, our aim is to find the material constants, the Young modulus and non-local parameter that minimize the difference between natural frequencies of discrete and continuum models. In doing so, we consider six different atomic chains having different lengths, and two different cases. In the first case, we ignore second neighbor relations. By the way, uh, I have to mention this point. Here, these curves are isomaterial parameter curves. Uh, so for instance, uh, this curve here gives the sets of Young modulus and non-local parameter that yields same fundamental frequency. 
And of course, we can obtain these curves for all atomic chains and for both uh, natural frequencies. And we see that all these curves, all these isomaterial curves intersect at a single point. And in this point, the non-local parameter is very close to zero, which suggests that when there is no second neighbor relations, there is no non-locality in the structure. So there is no need to use non-local theories and classical theory of elasticity is uh, sufficient or good enough to cover their behavior. In second case, we include the second neighbor relations. And as you can see here, there are two intersection points for two different frequency values. And both of these intersection values, uh, at both of these intersection values, the value of uh, non-local parameter is greater than zero, which means that when there is second neighbor relation, there is long range interaction. So there is non-locality, which needs the use of non-local theories. Of course, in, uh, in ideal world, world, we expect uh, to obtain one intersection point for both that satisfy both nature, uh, uh, yes, both natural frequencies. But uh, we believe uh, this is also uh, sufficiently close. Uh, so we can consider that uh, we obtain a unified non-local parameter. So with using these uh, optimized uh, parameters, we try to uh, compare the uh, deformation field or let's say the strain field of atomic chain and equivalent continuum mode. Uh, and for this purpose, we consider an atomic chain under uniformly distributed axial load. And as we can see here, there is a perfect agreement between discrete model and Eringen's model because, because both uh, covers long range interactions. So the capability of Eringen's model in such systems is presented, I believe. Of course, this can be extended to uh, two-dimensional arrays, but uh, I will not give any details right, uh, right now. Um, if uh, there is anyone interested, of course, we can. Uh, I, I can provide some details about the paper later. But overall, in two-dimensional case, again, we see the capability of Eringen's model in obtaining the displacement field uh, similar displacement field with discrete mode, as illustrated here for Flaman problem. Now, I want to continue with showing the capability of a macropolar model uh, through torsional problem of carbon nanotubes. Uh, this study is mainly conducted with uh, Dr. Izadi and with our, uh, myself, Professor Trevolushi and Professor Gavannus. Uh, contributions. So in this case, uh, we assume various armchair and zigzag nanotubes having different lengths and different diameters. And these nanotubes is fixed from one end and subjected to a twist at the other end. So to obtain uh, molecular dynamics simulations, we uh, use LAMPS, open, so uh, open source software LAMPS, and through these MD simulations, we extracted the torsional stiffness data. And using this torsional stiffness data, we calculated apparent shear, uh, apparent shear modules. So as we can see here, for armchair and zigzag nanotubes, apparent shear modulus depends on the diameter. In fact, it decreases with increasing diameter which is in contradict with the local behavior or local case, but it indicates macropolar behavior. So since uh, we see that carbon nanotubes have a macropolar character, we try to find their equivalent continuum model 
considering they as hollow circular cylindrical beams. And to obtain the uh, corresponding material parameters, we employ optimization method. And in this optimization method, our aim is to minimize, uh, to find material constants then that minimize the difference between efferent shear modulus obtained from discrete, in other words, MD simulations and continuum models. So here, the variation of apparent shear modulus with uh, these parameters is plotted. Uh, so here, it is very clear that there is a perfect agreement between MD simulations and a uh, micropolar model. Moreover, to be more specific, a unified internal land parameter is obtained, which is independent of diameter of independent of the land of the structure. So we obtain a unified internal land parameter for each class. And this internal land parameter is found to be relevant with underlying hexagonal lattice structure. So it has a physical interpretation. And last but not the least is we see the importance of accounting for not only size effects, but also arm symmetries in strain and stress measures. Because as you can see here, couple stress theory, which also inc incorporates size effects, have, has acceptable results, but not as good as micropolar model. So, the, the importance of relative rotations once again is emphasized. Uh, of course, uh, we uh, investigate the pure bending problem as well. Again, I'm not going to give too much detail about it, any actually any detail about it, but uh, similar outcomes are expected and obtained to be more clear. And uh, if you, uh, if anyone interested, uh, can contact with Dr. Izadi or uh, with other uh, collaborators, uh, collaborators of this work. So as we can see here, the application fields of explicit uh, or let's say Eringen's model and macropolar model are quite different. However, to understand their capabilities, their limitations, similarities and differences, we conducted uh, various comparative studies, including example problems of practical importance in engineering applications. Practically important, uh, yes, uh, example problems. Uh, so the first one is stress distribution problem in matrix circular inclusion problem subjected to uniaxial tension. So, uh, our aim in this problem is to um, obtain the effect of non-locality on the stress concentration factor, or in other words, on the maximum stress. So we want to obtain the stress field uh, around at the vicinity of the hole, and especially at the interface between inclusion and matrix materials. And this problem is important uh, in understanding the effect of heterogeneity in composite materials. So we obtain two different cases. Uh, in the first one, uh, we consider three different scale factors. By scale factor, I am referring to ratio between edge length and the radius of the uh, inclusion. Uh, to uh, understand the uh, effect uh, of finite and infinite domains on the stress concentration factor. And we consider four different material properties. Here, the first one is full local model, and the fourth one is full non-local model. Of course, by non-local model, uh, we either use Eringen's model, explicit type Eringen's model, and implicit type or implicit type macropolar model 
to make a comparison. Uh, I want to emphasize the difference between these two models one more time in the framework, in the two dimensional framework, considering a plain strain assumption. So this is the stress field of an element. And here we see the stiffness matrix. So for Eringan's model in this type of problem, we have two standard material parameters, lame constant and shear modulus, and two non-locality related material constant, friction coefficient and non-local parameter. So here, non-local parameter is directly integrated to the convolution type constitutive equation, which gives the stress field. That is why it is called strong non-local model. On the other hand, we see that in micropolar model, the internal land parameter uh, is incorporated to the uh, one of the elasticity matrices, which is linked to the newly introduced additional descriptors. That is why this theory has limited or weak non-local character. And for isotropic structures, if the coupling number and uh, the land scale parameter approaches to zero, of course, the local theory is covered, recovered. Now let's continue with the example. So again, we consider four material properties. Uh, of course, in this problem, we assume that the general material properties, lamma constant, shear modulus, and micropolar constants and non-local parameter is known. However, the friction coefficient in Eringen's model is tailored, is determined through optimization procedure. And in this case, our aim to find, our aim is to find the friction coefficient that minimizes the stress, the difference between stress concentration factor of implicitly non-local Coursera and explicitly non-local Eringen's model considering all these three cases uh, an infinite domain. The reason why we consider infinite domain for optimization is uh, for infinite domains, we have uh, analytic expressions of stress concentration factor, factor for micropolar. And through this optimization procedure, we were able to obtain a unified material parameter that satisfies the stress concentration factor for all of these three cases. So now with using these material properties, we are going to uh, obtain the stress, normal stress field uh, at the domains. Here, these are materials one, two, three, and four. And the left half uh, corresponds to Coursera, and the right half corresponds to Eringen's model. So I will start with the smallest uh, scale ratio. Uh, so the smallest scale ratio, uh, in the smallest scale ratio, uh, the length, the edge length, is comparable with the diameter of the inclusion. So this case has the mo most pronounced uh, non-locality. The non-locality is, in this case, is more pronounced, let's say. Um, so the things that I am going to say, of course, is valid for all other scale ratios. First of all, we see that when using uh, non-local models, the maximum stress, or let's say the stress mismatch between matrix and inclusion uh, reduces. So this is the local case, and these are the non-local cases in which matrix, in both cases, the matrix is modeled using a non-local model. And both Eringen and Coursera models are able to uh, avoid, let's say, um, have the, have the capa uh, capability to avoid stress singularity in geometric discontinuity. So for uh, problems for models uh, with uh, Eringen type matrix, we see 
an increase in stress at inclusion close to boundaries and a decrease in stress at matrix again close to boundaries and these both cases can be attributed to the strong non-local character of Eringen's model. Because in this case, there are missing neighbor relations as the domain is finite. That is why the stress here is reduced. On the other hand, for this case, we know that uh, stress at a point is related to strain of entire domain, which is why uh, for points that are cl close to interface, uh, the stress is uh, affected by the strain of matrix. That is why here we obtain an increase in the stress at the inclusion part. So, uh, of course, uh, we can see uh, counterplots of normal stress for other scalar ratios as well. So these are zoom in looks to better uh, see the uh, variation of normal stress uh, at the vicinity of inclusion. And these are the zoom out looks to show the boundary effects of Eringen model around the domain boundaries. And this is the case. Uh, for the largest scale ratio, with, uh, which refers to uh, infinite domains. Again, the things, uh, the, the points we mentioned is still valid. And now to show uh, the effect of non-locality with scale ratio, we are going to com compare the results of uh, normal stress for smallest and largest scale ratios. So this is the variation of normal stress, normal stress along y-axis, along this line. I hope you can see it. So independent of the continuum theory that is used, which could be either local or non-local, as the scale ratio, the ratio between edge land and inclusion decreases, the stress concentration factor increases. As scale uh, ratio decreases, the effect of non-locality become more pronounced as expected because the dimensions become comparable. Uh, it is clear from these differences, as we can see for the smallest uh, scale ratio, the reduction in normal stress is more pronounced due to more pronounced non-locality. Another important point is, as this scale ratio decreases, the boundary effects uh, of Eringen's model becomes pronounced uh, at the inclusion, around the inclusion. That is why, due to these boundary effects, uh, there is a slight increase in normal stress for the smallest aspect ratio. So, uh, as the second example, uh, we uh, examine stress distribution uh, in elliptic holes under, uh, again, uniaxial tension. So here, our aim is to obtain the stress field, uh, or let's say the effect of non-local theories on stress field of a plate that is weakened with an elliptic hole. Uh, so for this problem, again, we employ finite element method, but this time, due to very fine mesh, mesh discretization, we use symmetric models. Of course, obtaining symmetric model for Cosera and Cauchy is straightforward. However, for Eringen's model, we need to uh, employ or we need to do some tricks. Because in Eringen's model, there is long range interaction. And we need to cover these long range interactions in the symmetric model. Otherwise, our results will be misleading. 
And to obtain uh, the effect of sharpness of the aspect ratio, we consider three different cases. First, I want to briefly talk about the formation of non-conventional symmetric FE model. So in this case, the red uh, atom, uh, not atoms, I'm sorry, the red nodes and red elements are imaginary nodes or imaginary elements. Their energy are not explicitly uh, included in the calculations, but their displacement field is used to correctly determine or include the long range interaction of the elements in conventional quarter model. So these nodes are slave nodes and they due to symmetric conditions, uh, they need to be deformed in accordance with their counterparts in the uh, quarter model or master uh, part of the FE model. So these nodes, the slave and master nodes are connected through a transformation matrix. And with utilizing this transformation matrix, uh, we obtain an equation system that has same dimensions as conventional quadratic model. Another important point here is the incorporation of geodetical path. Uh, in general, we, uh, the distance is, or let's say Euclidean distance is used in kernel function to relate source points and neighboring points. Uh, however, this is not valid for discontinuous domain. So if a domain has defects or discontinuity, we need to determine the shortest interior path that connects source and neighboring point. Of course, in this problem, uh, finding this path is quite easy because we are dealing with a uh, ellipse. So uh, for instance, for this case, the uh, geodetic, we have two options. Uh, the, ge the first one is here, the geodetic path number one, and the geodetic path number two. So the one, the shortest one is used in kernel function. Of course, as I said, uh, dealing with an elliptic hole is easy. That is why creating a reboost algorithm for such a discontinuity is easy. However, if you have structures with um, arbitrary defects or structures with curved boundaries, a more uh, practical and a more robust uh, algorithm must be established, but this is completely a different topic. So for this problem, since our aim is to compare the stress fields, uh, we assume that the material constants, uh, the general, the standard material constants are known, the micropolar material constants are known in which the internal landscape parameter varies, as you can see here, because the A is constant, so uh, the internal land parameter varies. And we assume that the non-local parameter is known. So again, here we try to find the friction coefficient uh, that minimize the, uh, the difference between stress concentration factors obtained for micropolar and Eringen's model. Of course, we perform this for different aspect ratios and different internal land parameters. So here, as you can see, as different from the previous, the example number one, for this problem, having a unified value that is acceptable for all aspect ratios is not possible. As you can see for different aspect ratios and for same internal land parameter, we obtained different friction coefficients, not a single unified friction coefficient. Otherwise these uh, three curves uh, must be coincide. So the reason for this variation is because when, um, 
the uh, elliptic hole becomes sharper, the um, missing neighbor relations are decreased, and the structure becomes more stiff. And to compensate this stiffness and to have the same stress concentration factor as Coursera model, the non-locality of Eringen's model needs to be increased by decreasing the fraction coefficient. That is why for various aspect ratios, or let's say when the elliptic hole, become, elliptic hole becomes sharper, we need to obtain corresponding non-local uh, parameter or corresponding fraction coefficient. Uh, so before moving, I want to mention one point. For the non-local parameter considered here in, and for the uh, geometry considered in our study, the uh, results, uh, the geodetic distance and Euclidean distance does not affect the numerical results considerably. As one can see, uh, for the worst case scenario, the results uh, obtained with uh, adopting Euclidean distance or geodetic distance varies only 0.80%. But of course, uh, this is limited to this study. For different geometries or for higher non-local values, the geodetic path, including the geodetic path, uh, might lead to different values, different stress fields. Um, so let's continue. As we can see here, as the land scale parameter increases, which means as the non-locality increases, the stress concentration factor decreases because non-locality become more pronounced. And we know that non, uh, and we know that it reduces the maximum stress value. So it is also evident from numerical values for uh, the largest aspect ratio, the reduction in stress concentration factor with respect to local case is uh, 36%, while for sharper edge, for uh, smallest aspect ratio, the reduction of stress concentration factor with respect to local case is almost 50%. Uh, also, we show uh, the counterplot of normal stress and the variation of normal stress along y-axis considering uh, the most pronounced non-local case. And again, as we can see here, uh, with incorporating non-local models, with using non-local models, stress singularities in, uh, in case of geometric discontinuities can be avoided. Of course, this is uh, also the case for localized loads, but I am not going to uh, talk about this uh, here today. So with employing, with adopting non-local models, the stress uh, the, uh, reduction, uh, we reduce the stress at the interface. And we see that for sharper holes, we need to increase the non-locality to keep the stress concentration factor in accordance with the corresponding macropolar model, and which leads to better uh, load distribution capacity. So finally, throughout this presentation, I hope I will be able to show you the inadequacy of classical theory in the existence of scale effects, the necessity of using non-local theories for structures with comparable internal and external land scales, the capability of Eringen's theory on covering long range interactions, the capability of micropolar theory in the existence of relative rotations, uh, and we see that non -local, employing non-local theories avoid, avoid stress singularities in problems possessing geometric discontinuity. And we see that having an equivalency between these two models in a localized manner does not guarantee an overall equivalency in the entire domain. So 
these are the references and thank you for listening. Mera, yes. your microphone doesn't work. What? I am talking and talking for an hour. And Could you just uh, repeat uh, the slide of uh, final remarks? Uh, excuse me, Professor, but uh, we, we heard the last slide. Really? We heard the, uh, yes, we okay. heard the last slide. There was no problem, at oh. least for the... Okay, <laughs> I'm glad. Just, just come back to the final remarks to only. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, do you want me to repeat them? Uh, yes, Mera, please, because in the room, uh, uh -huh. the room we have some problem of connection. Uh, we missing the last part of your presentation. Okay, okay. So um, throughout this presentation, I hope uh, I can show the inadequacy of classical theory uh, in the existence of scale effects and the necessity of using non-local theories for structures with comparable internal and external land scales and the capability of Eringen's theory on covering long-range interactions and, of course, uh, the materials that are characterized by these long-range interactions, and the capability of micropolar model in the existence of relative rotations. And we show that the non-local theories avoid stress singularities in problems possessing geometric discontinuities, and of course, although we can find some sort of equivalency between, uh, you know, localized points, this does not guarantee an overall equivalency, as we can see that uh, the stress field, all, although the stress concentration factors uh, equal, the stress field in the domain varies depending on the type of non-locality. Thank you. Thank you, Meryl, very much for your uh, rigorous you. and uh, detailed presentation on the features of uh, non-local theories uh, on which uh, I wish to focus uh, the attention uh, for the relevance that they have uh, in uh, the problem of modeling of complex uh, materials of uh, any kind. And uh, I do hope that uh, after this course, uh, our uh, PhD students and other participants uh, will be at least uh, uh, suggested by this uh, information that uh, we are uh, giving uh, and uh, try to consider also this uh, possibility, this important possibility of uh, modeling of four materials. And uh, I want to, to ask a short discussion if someone uh, wants to intervene. Also by asking something concerning my previous lecture or uh, everything what you uh, like to, to know about uh, this uh, topic. I guess that you are very tired because this day was a little bit heavy, but I hope that when we send you 
the PDF and the registrations of the lessons, you can uh, deepen your knowledge about these topics and then discuss in uh, a new occasion. I don't know if someone that is present in the room wants, wants to ask for something. Everything is clear. <laughs> yes, actually, I, about uh, no I just wanted to thank so, for. If, uh, yes, I just wanted there is, to thank for uh, the no, very. Well, there are no questions. I want to thank uh, Dr. Tuna again for uh, her presentation and uh, invite you to join us uh, in the last uh, session of the last day session of uh, this uh, course on multi-scale modeling uh, for uh, complex uh, composite materials. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Razie. Uh